for being here. It's a real pleasure and honor to be with you. I'm going to talk about the theme of the conference in a slightly roundabout way. Uh, I think the theme of empire philosophically is connected to the search for dignity. And my next book project is entitled Indignity, because actually indignity is a much more recurrent feature than dignity, and it turns out so, uh, present in everyday lives of individuals and nations. And what I'm going to do in the next four or five minutes is to read from a chapter of my forthcoming book on indignity um, for about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and then talk about the project and how that connects with the of the conference. Um, Free, as Amy mentioned, which is the last book I have written, tries to tackle questions of freedom and um, justice in a country like Albania that has had to contend with empires um, and in fact prided itself for throughout my childhood for being one of the very few countries in the world that was fighting both Soviets and Anglo-Americans, so two kinds of imperialisms at the same time, though very different from each other, and does that through um, a literary exploration and so by using a combination of history, literature, philosophy to talk about kind of contemporary issues but also through a historical and um, a lens that thinks about the future in light of what we know from the past. So I'm going to do the same, and I do the same in this next book. So I'm going to just go straight into the reading, and it will be uh, become clear what the project is as I just get into the chapter and read you from the chapter, and then I'm going to talk a bit more about the project more generally. So this is now the reading starting. I'm looking for the authority for information concerning documentation of the former state security service, I say, placing myself in front of the first taxi parked on Comuna Parisit. One of the newish busy roads lined up with shops and cafes that connect the center of Tirana to the outer ring of the city. I hesitate to call it my road, even though my family lives there and has been my official home address for at least 15 years. Already when we moved to Tirana, the question, or rather remark, you're not from here, right? Came up with nagging regularity every time I started one of those casual conversations with strangers that seemed as harmless in the way they started as they risked turning awkward the longer they lasted. Already then I resented the unspoken hierarchy between those who acquired the from here title by birth and those who betrayed by their accents would have to justify their presence in the city. When my family moved to Tirana, around the time I left Albania to study in Italy, my father was unemployed. He joined the reserve army of those who hoped to find a job in a larger center. An illusion he shared with many, just as he shared the disillusionment that followed. I have no happy memories of the place. My only neutral associations to it are news items, communist era films, and more recently traffic jams. The most extended stay I've had to endure in the city was when my father and grandmother died in unexpectedly in quick succession and I was forced to return to make funeral arrangements and Turkish coffee for visitors. Locked in the kitchen during the compulsory 40 days of mourning, I remember feeling a distinct sense of guilt that I had gone back too late. Too late twice. And perhaps to alleviate the guilt, I started blaming the city. Most people who return to Tirana tend to remark how much it has changed in the last few years. There are now more concrete buildings, paved roads, cafes, bars, and cycle paths. For me, it's a place of grief, guilt, and counterfactuals. When I visit, I get lost in small alleyways that run through the city like so many misplaced veins, and I'm barely able to orient myself even in the pretentiously named Paris Commune, the neighborhood that is supposed to be my home. My own. Perhaps a part of me unconsciously wants to be lost to remind myself that I never fully belong and it's now too late to remedy. I'm looking for the authority for information concerning documentation of the former state security service, I repeat. Surprising myself that for the second time I've introduced the office in the same formal way it has introduced itself in the email inviting me for an appointment. The taxi driver doesn't hear me at first. A gray-haired man in his 70s with a hollowed out face covered by thick, dark sunglasses, he wears a checked short sleeved skirt, a shirt, and a red Make America Great Again cap. There's loud music coming from his yellow Mercedes Benz, a radio station called Top Go that plays old classics. As I stand in front of the taxi waiting for his reaction, 
I recognize the sound of the flatters, only you, struggling to beat Lady Gaga, just dance. Emerging from the taxi lined up after his, he's not listening to the music. The station has clearly been chosen to attract a certain kind of customer. Instead, he's smoking, entirely absorbed in the newspaper. I'm looking for the authority for information concerning documentation of the former state security service, I repeat impatiently. I must sound worried, or at least agitated, because the tone of my voice prompts the driver to finally detach his eyes, switch the radio, toss the butt of the unfinished cigarette outside the car window, and turn towards me with an expression of benign concern. Take it easy, he says. Take a seat. Who's that you're looking for? Oh. I mutter something, confused by the fact that he has not recognized the official name of my destination. I'm looking for the office with all the files. You know, the former Sigurimi archives. You're not from here, right? <laughs> he asks, once the car engines are on and we're making our way through the busy morning traffic. I smile, trying to conceal my irritation. I wonder what gave that away. Well, you said you're going to the former Sigurini archives. There's foreigners talk. There's no foreigners here. It's all the same people. My kids, they live in Florida. They come once a year. They say it all looks different. Nonsense. I want to insist I said no such thing, but there is no pause in the conversation. I'm old. I used to be an import-export uh, truck driver, traveled the world before everyone else. I was in Krakow, in Poland. Do you know how many times? He stops and gives a long whistle as if he wanted the sound to cover the distance from Tirana to Krakow and back. <laughs> the sunglasses are from those days. I like them. They make everything look darker. Trust me, nothing has changed. It's all as it was. This has changed though, hasn't it? I say, pointing at the interminable line of cars stuck in front of a traffic light just before turning onto Four Heroes Street. They can't drive them, he replies with the evident satisfaction of someone prepared to crush such a superficial objection. Would be better if it didn't have them. Other things have changed too, I say. More to see how he will handle the next challenge. Look at all those new trees planted. Aha, you're just like my daughter, he says. She lives in Florida. She only comes from New Year's Eve and she falls in love with the lights on the trees. Have you seen what's going on here in the winter? There are so many lights, they think there's a war. All because of the Christmas decorations. If you come at any other time, you'll see it for yourself. It's all the same. All the same people. Nothing has changed. Even the trees know it. I'm still thinking about the connection between trees, war, and Christmas decorations, because it is the end of May, after all. But he breaks the car suddenly, and from the open window, curses the other drivers on the road, trying to force a U-turn. We've just passed before Etienne Bay Mosque, curved left into George W. Bush Street, and we're about to reach Jean d'Arc Boulevard when he decides to change route. I just remembered something, he explains. You want to go to the new office, right? The one where they recently moved to. I shrug. Not sure, I say, pulling out my phone to double check the address. I have here Unit 4, Skanderberg Military Garrison. I'm starting to find reassuring the formality of the email as well as the fact that each time I look at it, the content has not changed. Come for an appointment on Tuesday, bring an ID, ensure the fee has been paid in advance, and I particularly appreciate going over the names of family members, my father, my grandmother, my grandfather, the way the list of names is offered to me, like some kind of meal deal in a spirit of commercial detachment that is just what I need at this stage. Nothing to feel emotional about, just the secret lives of a random group of people to whom I was assigned at birth. Like specific items of food are assigned a discount. He nods. Yeah, that's the one. They moved there recently. There was some grant from the Swedish embassy or the Swedish government, or maybe it was Denmark. No, it was Sweden, actually. Yeah, Sweden. I saw the ambassador. She's a nice woman, very well dressed, apparently. Are you going there for work or for fun? <laughs> to dig into my grandmother's past, I think to talk to her, to feel less guilty, to finally bury her, to find the truth, to see if my father was a spy, to write a book, to see if it's all history, or if it's not history yet. Or maybe I just have to go without knowing why, to make myself feel better or feel worse. For fun, I say. <laughs> if I leave you here, will you be okay? Once we're parked in front of the soldiers guarding the entrance to the military complex, he looks at me. 
They point to the sign that indicates standing there is prohibited. Wait, I say, let me check with them. Is this the entrance to the authority for information concerning documentation of the former state security service? I notice there are guns pointing downwards and think they must be fake. You're not from here, right? <laughs> One of them laughs. And I worry that if he laughs too much, he will lose control of that gun. And what if it's not fake? Not from here, no, I say. I have imagined my visit to the office like the inspection of an abandoned battle scene. A harrowing walk through dark labyrinths smelling of death and mold. Or like a frozen pit, some sort of descent into Dante's man's circle of hell, where the ultimate sinners, those who betrayed their family, their friends, their country, and ultimately humanity are punished. For Dante, the ninth circle of hell is cold, silent, and motionless. Cold to symbolize the cruelty of people whose hearts never knew any feelings of warmth. Motionless because only love is an active feeling. Deception, like evil, has no positive existence. And silent to symbolize the limits of speech and the suicide of language when words serve to destroy rather than communicate. But instead of Dante's frozen pit, I find myself in a space that looks like a crossover between an IKEA showroom and a hospital waiting hall. The symmetry with which the straight furniture has been positioned reminds me of the austerity of lines in a Mondrian artwork. The tiles are gray and shiny, and the white walls have been newly repainted, and on the facade one can read only two words, files authority. Your documents are there in JPG format. An employee who has introduced herself as Vera shows me a black Dell laptop that has been ceremonially placed on a working desk in the center of the room. The laptop seems so decrepit, I wonder if it was also a present from the Swedes. I'm told this is where researchers come. Though I can't see any other researchers, only three other employees sipping Turkish coffee. And one of them offers to make me an espresso. I decline and seem to upset her. But Vera points out that I am the Marxist author of a book about freedom, which makes her smile and gesture as if this explained everything. <laughs> If you need the files printed, or if you want to take PDF documents with you, here's a list with the costs. You applied as a researcher, right? If you had applied as a family member, it would have been free. I am not distracted by the question. Are there no physical files? I finally mustered the courage to say. The employee who offered to make me coffee gives me a strange expression, as if she's trying to decide whether to categorize my intervention as a provocation or let it go. Eventually, she tightens her lips, raises one eyebrow, and directs her finger to the chair next to the researcher's desk. Be careful when you sit on that chair, she says. It wobbles. Also, the computer is slow. Don't keep pressing buttons. Give it some time. <laughs> the computer desktop is bare, deep blue, with no icons on the dock, other than the three files containing the information I requested. They are labeled Form File 531, Le Manuti, my grandmother. Inquisitive Judicial File 1355, Jaffer my father. Inquisitive Judicial File 1384, Arslan my grandfather. I click on the mouse to open the first document and wait for what appears to be an eternity. But since nothing happens, I move on to the second, then the third, and repeat the action, and I start tapping at the keyboard each time harder than the previous one, like some kind of toddler discovering a piano, except they're surprised to find out that they have some control over it, but disappointed that it's not producing the sound they expected. Eventually, I give up pretending everything is going according to plan and look helplessly towards Vera, who is intensely studying the bottom of her coffee cup. I wait a few moments, then start pressing Control Alt Delete. Take it easy, she says when she notices that I'm stuck, making a sign to interpret, which I interpret as an order to vacate the chair. Which file do you want first? She asks, once the computer has been restarted. I shrug. Whichever you manage to open. She nods, visibly satisfied. She continues to click competently until a yellow page appears. At the center of it, I recognize my grandmother's name, handwritten in black pencil. I'm slightly distracted by the sound that the wooden chair makes as it starts to wobble. And a few seconds later, I notice that it's my body that's triggering the motion. It's shaking as if it was standing naked in the middle of a frozen pit, and I seem unable to control it. And I also seem unable to concentrate on the meaning of the sentences that appear one after the other. Top left of the page, Interior Ministry, 
Directorate of State Security and the People's Police Section of Internal Affairs. Top right and almost faded, extremely secret. Further down, a more recent annotation. Fully declassified with decision number 15 taken 30th of May 2022 by the Authority for Information of the Documents of the Former State Security. Several unintelligible words scribbled by hand. Archive number 531 circled in red. Two lines with generalities. Further down, pseudonym. That line is empty, and though I can't be entirely certain of its meaning, for a split second my body stops shaking and I can hear myself breathing a sigh of relief. Then immediately after, I start to feel cold again, and my teeth are chattering. Is there air conditioning on? I ask the employees. It's so cold here. They look at me as if the question were rhetorical, a statement uttered mainly out of a desire to communicate something. And Vera makes a clicking sound with her tongue. It was on this morning, she replies apologetically, but we turned it off because the director said we need to save energy now that we are at war. I must look perplexed. Well, we're in NATO. She corrects herself. Same thing. I nod in sign of understanding, then return to the page. I notice a drawing in the middle, a doodle, filled with small circles drawn around something that reads like sect, followed by a Roman number that looks like seven. Someone must have been bored at work. Then my attention is caught by a single word that appears in the middle of the page and has been underlined three times, Greek. It makes no sense. And I continue to scroll until the same word appears again in the next page, where other generalities are recorded. Citizenship, Greek. Name and surname, Leman Dupi, my grandmother. Place of birth, Salonika. Ethnicity, Albanian. Profession, employee of the education ministry. Religion, Muslim. Registered, 29th December 1952. Name of referent who performed the registration, Mayor Hairedin Chinami. Reason for registration, suspected as foreign agent. On page six of the file, the strange word, Greek, recurs again. Leman Upi, born in Salonika of Greek citizenship. A series of handwritten instructions also appear. Check if someone with this name and Greek citizenship is registered in file collection one and file collection two, followed by another handwritten note. There is nothing here, with here underlined in pencil, and signed Vice Colonel DB. Citizenship, Greek. Greek citizenship, I repeat to myself. Then scroll back to the first page with a doodle where the word Greek has been written separately until the, under the doodle and followed by a proposal to categorize as 2B. It's bizarre to think of my grandmother as Greek. She spoke French to me most of the time. And although I knew she was born in Salonika, I hardly thought of Salonika as a place let alone as a Greek city. She always referred to it as Salonique la Magnifique, but Salonique la Magnifique has always been for me a site of the mind rather than a location on earth. Not space, but time, a time lost before I could know it. Most of the time, Salonique la Magnifique was a combination of sounds from French, Albanian, Turkish, Ladino, Italian, and yes, Greek, but only in small part. I keep reading the word Greek and it's hard to associate it to my grandmother. Instead, my mind wanders to my first exam at university in Rome and the wobbly chair on which I was sitting then too, staring at the open page of metaphysics book Zeta, struggling with the question. Signorina, can you remember what Aristotle's term for essence in Greek is? The essence of an entity is what makes that entity be what it is. But how does Aristotle define it exactly? An embarrassing silence follows. Come on, signorina, everyone knows this. We covered it in class, and you also know it from the last year of high school. It seems inappropriate to point out that in my country, in my last year of high school, there was a war and everything was shot. And that we never studied Aristotle. Back then, Aristotle was just the name of my next door Greek Orthodox neighbor. If I really had to think of someone famous called Aristotle back then, only the second husband of Jackie Kennedy would occur. <laughs> I roll my eyes, stare outside the window, and decide to count the titles on the tiles on the floor. I think that if I fail, the worst that can happen is that I will lose my scholarship and return to where I came from. Come on, signorina. The Greek term for essence is toti and einai, what it is to be, which uh, must be corrected, the examiner insists, to what it was to be. 
Since the present tense has crept in later day translations and misled entire generations of Aristotle commentators. Right, I say. It's important, the examiner insists. So was the husband of Jackie Kennedy, I think. Now it turns out that my grandmother's Toti and Einai is also in her past. It turns out her essence, her what it is, or was to be, is Greek. I continue to scroll down the file and up again, but at this point my brain has decided to play a trick on me. I'm only able to read the sentences where the term Greek appears. The rest is entirely unintelligible. It might as well have been written in the language of Aristotle. There it is again at the top of page seven. On the basis of evidence concerning oppositional activity against the people, and suspicions of being an agent for foreign intelligence services, in particular Greek, we propose to categorize as 2B and to prepare a preliminary investigation on citizen Lemanuti born in Salonika of Albanian ethnicity and Greek citizenship. You always speak Greek when you have a secret. I must have been five or six the first time I uttered those words in anger. It was New Year's Eve and my grandmother's cousin had just arrived on the evening train. One of their animated, mysterious conversations in French about Salonique la Magnifique had been suddenly interrupted so they could switch to Greek. I thought of it as a deliberately hostile act. But no, she replied, we were trying to remember the lyrics of a lullaby we used to sing when we were little girls like you. It just felt strange to translate it. And she sang it in Greek. And again in Turkish, except that the word for canary in Turkish was bimbuli the same as Nightingale in Albanian, and the song felt comforting instead of threatening. I was so enraptured by it that since then she would sing it to me every night before going to sleep. Greek, I think, like the song about canaries. Greek, not like Aristotle, more like the Bilbili. The chair then stopped wobbling, and I'm no longer shaking. I have enough confidence to concentrate again on the open file on my computer, where another report appears, typeset and signed by some vice colonel TV again. The reason and the material we dispose for a preliminary investigation around the possible categorization as 2B, the vice governor writes, are the following. The fact that even though Le Manupi has been living here a long time, she continues to carry Greek citizenship and is always hoping to be able to return to Greece. The fact that even though she's been privately advised to apply for Albanian citizenship, she has not only rejected the option, but in the presence of the elements she trusts most, she has expressed hatred towards the People's Republic and the party in power. She has also expressed hatred towards the Soviet Union and indeed towards the whole socialist camp. And on the other hand, she has praised life in Greece and the freedom enjoyed by people there, making comparisons between Greece and Albania. Based on her contacts with our collaborator, the Tribune, in addition to what has been mentioned above, where she has expressed her hostility to the people's power, she has gone even further, raising suspicions that she must be an agent of the Greek intelligence services. This for the following reasons. I stop reading. The chills on my spine are gone, but I've now started to feel nauseous. It must be the yellow color of those typeset sheets or the persistent scrolling on the blue screen, or the fact that I've not had breakfast, or the fact that the canaries have disappeared, replaced by metaphysics Zeta. In the presence of the most trusted elements, I read again, then turn impatiently to the employee. Who is the Tribune? I ask. And what does 2B mean? Excuse me, Nera says. There's someone called the Tribune mentioned here who has made allegations that my grandmother was a Greek spy. I'm not sure this file is hers. It's not that I seriously think any of the employees will be able to answer my query. It's more that I can't continue reading on my own. The room is just too cold, too silent, and I feel trapped, unable to move and unable to think. Someone called the Tribune Someone whom my grandmother knows and loves, and in whom she has confided, has produced a report, the existence of which she ignores. She trusts the Tribune, without knowing that the Tribune is also a most trusted element by the state. If only I could persuade the Tribune that Nina's words have been misinterpreted, that my grandmother and this woman have nothing to do with each other, perhaps the accusations will be dropped. It must be an informant pseudonym, the employee says. We don't know the real names. If you look carefully in the file, there must be a list. I scroll up until a page appears entitled List of Collaborators with Pseudonyms. It contains only three lines, handwritten in fountain pen, with numbers appended to each of them. And I read out loud. One, the Tribune. Two, white chewing gum. 
free wind of March. The employees laugh. They're all like that, they say. The pseudonyms of collaborators. Well, one, one wonders who came up with them. I don't find it funny. These three entities are like vindictive Greek gods. They're about to hit like a natural catastrophe, like a hurricane or a flood. There's an emergency. A human being, my grandmother, needs help. She's about to be convicted for high treason and her life will change dramatically. And I tap and tap on the computer screen, scrolling up and down the file, increasingly desperate as if a disaster were unfolding before my eyes. Someone must intervene to find the Tribune, to ask why they're doing this. It must be possible to explain that there's been a mistake and that my grandmother is most certainly not a Greek spy and that her essence must not become that of a 2B. If you file a request for further information as a family member, you can find the real names of the informants, Vera says. Then you'll know who was behind the whole thing. Was, I think. Is it all in the past? Her, what it was to be? I look at the screen again, and again I'm unable to read past the word Greek. Do you want to find out who it was? Vera insists. I can show you how to fill the forms. Here's a list with the fees. End of the reading. <laughs> surveillance, control of the population, and uh, border enforcement and socialist principles coexisted in Central and Eastern Europe and in the Balkans for a lot of the 20th century has always seemed to be a kind of weird paradox. Because how could a theory that aspired to the withering away of the state end up entrenching the state even further? And how could workers of all countries unite, which uh, was the slogan, result in the harshest set of policies enforcing separation by national borders? And how could the effort to free oneself from the power of bureaucracy result in one of the toughest surveillance systems that the world has ever known? So all the standard answers to this question usually emphasize the fact that there was an absent liberal public sphere in Central Eastern Europe and in the Balkans, or they talk about the repressive nature of socialist rule, or they talk about the concentration of power by party bureaucrats, or the substitution of economic elites by political elites. And the more fundamental question seems to me, which is at the basis of all of these ones, has to do with the historical circumstances in which former socialist states emerged and developed, and the way in which they embarked on these nation-building projects, which were committed to both consolidating socialism and fighting global capitalism on the one hand, but also consolidating the nation state in the aftermath of the fall of empires on the other hand. So by the end of World War I, uh, the Habsburg, the Ottoman and the Russian empires all had stopped existing and they were all replaced by new nation states. And so people and communities that had been living uh, with porous borders up to that point suddenly found themselves uh, to be minorities that were decided by international treaty where they belonged. And my grandmother was born in Salonika, ended up being like that. Um, either they were groups that were told that they had to be, they were Greek, stay in Greece, and if they were Turkish, had to go back to Turkey, or they were Albanian minorities like my grandmother, where they had a choice, but they were still assigned the status of a kind of legal entity that was decided by fiat, by the great powers at the end of the first. World War. So a variety of multicultural, multi-ethnic, uh, non-territorial political institutions disappeared almost overnight and they were replaced by these new nation states, all of which had to contend for their territorial sovereignty and for territorial integrity, threatened all of them by the great powers who were disputing their resources. And on the other hand, they also had to build their, uh, to legitimize their nation building efforts. So that seems to me gave Eastern European socialism this paradoxical feature. It was almost like a kind of congenital birth defect. On the one hand, these were all states uh, that had emerged from the collapse of empires in East Central Europe and uh, had to build the state as a nation state on the one hand, but also build socialism at the same time. And so on the one hand, the kind of socialist powers, and they could do that because they were inspired by these socialist movements who went on to gain power in Central and Eastern Europe at the time, who were committed to a variety of Marxism, which was Marxism and Leninism, that managed to reconcile the defense of socialism with the defense of self-determination at the expense of other ways of understanding Marxism, which, was less, which were less hospitable to this combination of nationalism and socialism, including projects of Austro-Marxism, including uh, Rosa Luxemburg that was mentioned earlier, and so on. 
And while in the short term, this meant that these Eastern European states didn't suffer the fate of their Western European socialist counterparts because uh, they continued to kind of develop socialism, in the long run, the paradox became very obvious. And it meant that the states, these nation states that were emerging from the collapse of empire, began to consolidate themselves and to build bureaucracy, to consolidate, to centralize power, to build a very strong administration, to consolidate a kind of surveillance and punishment system, which in the end prevailed over the imperative of coordinating transnationally and fighting global capitalism as was intended by the kind of Marxist principles that inspired them. So when socialism was over, not just as a theory, but also as a practice in the 90s, uh, so also as an aspirational discourse, the only thing that they were left with was the nationalism that they had started with. So they were combining constantly throughout their history, nationalism and socialism. Socialism was gone and they were just left with, with nationalism. And I think that contributes to, uh, continues to shape the politics in which they are now and also explains why the far right and why nationalist populist movements surge and are so strong in these kinds of um, areas. So what the book tries to do uh, is it's partly a kind of philosophical text, partly a political history, partly a kind of family saga, which is an effort to explore the political and the moral meanings of the concept of dignity in connection to uh, the emergence of the states and uh, the ideological clashes that shaped the uh, consolidation of this kind of political authority in Eastern Europe and in the Balkans by following the first 35 years of life of a main character, Le Manufi, who you just met, was my grandmother, uh, who is also a character in my other book where she is uh, embodying this kind of specific idea of freedom as moral agency, and which I try to uh, continue as an analysis of freedom in, uh, in indignity, uh, and to explain how it forms on the one hand the core of moral commitments of human agency, but also constant search for meaning at the collective political level after the collapse of um, empires, and how it's constantly negotiated in these both individual and collective political projects where you see different ideologies each trying to appropriate the meaning of dignity uh, after in this kind of particular historical uh, context so she's a main character and she's an interesting character because she's born in the uh, in salonica in uh, just after the um, Salonika has been annexed by the Greek state, but while the Ottoman Empire is still going, so in the really, really very last years of the Ottoman Empire, uh, where her grandfather had been exiled by Sultan Abdul Hamid, and she was of Albanian origin, but at home everyone spoke French, as all aristocrats did within the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and she felt and was told that she was supposed to be Albanian, but in fact she'd never been to Albania. And at the point in which she was born, Albania wasn't even a state. Uh, it was in the south, it had been occupied by the Greeks. In the north, it had been occupied by the um, Serbs. France and Italy controlled a few scattered towns in the west, and Bulgaria and Austro-Hungary contended the rest. So it was a territory where there was a scramble for the resources and uh, by all these different great powers. And she was sent to study, so, so she was born in this kind of imperial context. She was sent to study in the Lycée Francais in uh, Salonica where she was the only girl in the school with mostly Sephardic Jews because Salonika was one of the cities with the highest proportion of Jews in the world at that point, uh, Sephardic Jews. And uh, only traveled to Albania when it became clear that Albanians needed to belong somewhere, that uh, Greeks had to go to Greece and Turks had to be in Turkey, and Albania was now, at one point, became an independent state, and so she went there in search for an identity and in search for a kind of collective sense of dignity, um, where as I say, Albania was just recognized by the League of Nations, and so she began to work in the state administration, met my grandfather, who was also himself returning from uh, Paris, who had been studying law, and they were both part of this kind of progressive elite that were trying to build a democratic socialist state, but not a communist state, so they were in a kind of power context with the, with the communists. The war was over, and, and that's what accompanied all their struggles while the Albanians were fighting against the fascists and against the Nazis during the Second World War. In 1946, the war was over, and she took up um, Albanian citizenship and participated in the first national elections, which were also the last elections in which non-communist candidates ran for office, after which my grandfather was arrested and sentenced to 15 years in prison, and after which she became the wife of a political prisoner and was deported uh, and was a mother of a, of a single child. And at that point, she was also placed under surveillance, suspected of being a Greek spy because she had just come from Greece to Albania. 
uh, and she started working in labor camps and be, what would be summoned regularly to the secret service offices with an offer to become an informant. So in the book, the story, her story is told by relying in, on two different temporal narratives. On the one hand, there is a first person narrative in which I talk about the experience of going to the archives and finding, uh, trying to look for the truth for my grandmother's life. And by talking about the series of visits where you begin to piece together this information around her that was available uh, by these, made available by these spies who had filed surveillance reports around her. And, uh, and where the kind of the problem of dignity is connected to the search for truth, because one of the convictions that shape post-communist politics in Eastern Europe and in the Balkans is this idea that you will not be able to have reconciliation, uh, that you will not be able to come to terms with the past until you find the truth that is in the archives about who spied on who and why were particular people implicated and why they went to prison and so on. And, uh, and the argument is that in many societies divided by the legacy of the past and in this kind of uh, historical injustice context, only the rest restitution of truth to the victims will be able to give them dignity and will also be able to give us the possibility to move beyond that, uh, that project. But, and so only after the truth in the archives has been found can one then have reconciliation. But what the book does is to show how that's actually not as simple as it looks. And uh, so that's where uh, this story only works if there is a truth to find and if you can trust the mechanisms of transmission of that truth in the archives. And the account that um, emerges in the book is much more unsettling because you discover as you follow this research for the truth that actually the archives had very little objective data. And by the end you ask, you know, how can you tell the story of a life and how can you give meaning to that life if you actually can't trust the mechanisms through which information about that person was being placed and you discover that there is no truth without interpretation and there's no interpretation without engaging with historical questions around how did these particular people were placed in these particular historical circumstances um, and how did those circumstances emerge. And so you discover that the facts of the matter as such are unreliable and what you need is to kind of piece together an interpretation of the facts which the archives themselves don't give you access to. So that's where the second uh, part to the second narrative line of the book becomes important because it takes the form of a, um, a, of a kind of historical novel where you try to imagine what her life might have been like. And so you follow her from her childhood in Salonika, from this post-imperial Ottoman context to see how she then moves into Tirana to find an identity and to become her own person and where she's kind of trying to fight for her dignity and to assert her will in this world that is increasingly different from the one in which she's born, which was shaped by the Ottoman Empire and by the categories of meaning available in the Ottoman Empire. And so her life is there reconstructed with the help of family records, um, newspaper articles, history books, government documents, and so on, and where the plot and the characters are instrumental to reconstructing that context. So from the first point of view, in the first person, you see her from the eyes of the state, and uh, you try to make sense of her life based on the court depositions of family members or people who were taken to trial or bureaucratic documents that the narrator kind of pieces together and in the second case which is in the third person you tell her story as a historical as I say as a kind of literary uh, product where you begin to think about why did the communists come to power in Albania? How did this post-imperial context shape their arriving into power? How did the power struggle take place? How did the larger ideological conflicts of the interwar period shape uh, the, the projects of socialists, of liberals, of fascists? And uh, how did they kind of try and, uh, how did they inform the building of the Albanian state? And at the end of the book, the two perspectives converge and lead to a kind of more general philosophical discussion around the problem of dignity and what it means at both an individual and at the collective level. So initially, I was planning to write the book only in the third person and thought of the project as a, as a kind of story that would be inspired by the life of my grandmother, but that would be put together and that would center on these questions of identity and nation and state building in the Balkans and discuss topics of, as I say, individual and collective identity in the aftermath of the collapse of empire. And uh, I was going to write about her just exploring these literary techniques. But when I started working on the book proposal, I traveled to Albania to visit these secret service archives and to get as much information about her as I could. And so during the first visit to the archives, I came across a lot of mistakes in the filing 
most puzzling of which was the fact that she was reported as single and not as married. And uh, in fact, it was written that her husband had died in Salonika when my grandfather was in prison at that time. And that her file was closed with a death certificate in 1953, which was also a kind of big mystery. So when I started asking about this around, people were saying to me things like, well, you know, in Albania, they just kept reporting, they needed to report something on, and so they just kept, kept feeding false information just so they could be seen to do their duty, the spies and the sort of kind of surveillance systems what, what kept, was kept by lies as much as by true reports around people's life. My mother had a different kind of benign interpretation. She said, well, she had a cousin who was very high up in the party, and so he probably introduced a false death certificate about her just to kind of close the file and give her a break from the um, authorities. And, uh, and so in the end, all of these things turned out to be wrong because I discovered doing more research that there was another person with exactly the same name and surname with the same birth date born in the same city from the same aristocratic background that she was, who had lived in Salonika roughly in the same years and came to Albania for the same reason in the same period. And so basically uh, the spies got confused. <laughs> and uh, so since the information that I was reading sometimes seemed completely accurate and about my grandmother, so I could read these files and recognize that this was her, also the description of her character sounded very much like her, so she's very proud and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, I was reading stuff that made completely no sense to me, including the fact that she was dead when she wasn't, because I had met her and I was not born in 1953. Um, basically, it was later confirmed, because when I looked for the identity of one of the informants, this tribune that just came up in the, in the chapter, I discovered that the tribune had also been convicted and executed for this filing mistake. And so they kind of... Uh, as I say, in the end, I had gone to the archives to find the truth about my grandmother, but what I found was another lie and another interpretation and another life that we had to kind of reckon with. And I also discovered then, continuing the research, that this other Lehmann, uh, this kind of doppelganger, had died alone and left no descendants. So, and she had kind of no people who could record her life and find her archives and so on and so forth. Since I was writing a book about dignity, I decided that uh, her life also deserved to be recorded somehow. And she deserved a kind of granddaughter and someone who would care about her and, and would write about her. And so I decided to kind of adopt her. And because the two characters were similar enough to confuse the spies, I decided that instead of trying to disentangle them in the book, I would kind of keep the blurring of the boundaries between the, the facts and the interpretation that I found in the archives and bring it over to the book and to continue the story writing about this one generic character that you don't know whether it was my grandmother or this other uh, general <laughs> individual. So instead of kind of cancelling one that I didn't know and immortalizing the one that I didn't know, I decided to kind of take them both together and construct a generic character and a generic life of someone like her that would have lived in that period whose kind of life reconstruction would help you explain and make sense of this forces that you find. And so I would kind of use this incident as a way to explicitly thematize the relationship between facts and fiction, between truth and interpretation, and between kind of individual and, and collective dignity. And as I say, I would try to find a way of tracing the continuity between history and literature. And so to show how sometimes you need literature to make sense of history and sometimes, um, uh, um, and, and, and sometimes the other way around. So this hybrid character, which is, as I say, part fictional and part not, is an interesting figure with which to explore the conflicts of the interwar period, but also to explore the legacy of the fall of empires on the state building projects to see the state surveillance um, apparatus, because she has this political identity of a unit that no longer exists. And she's in many ways, again, the kind of hybrid generic character is an, is an outlier in many ways. So she's a cosmopolitan in a nation building world. She's a woman in a world of men. She's a Muslim in a kind of, um, She's a secularist in a Muslim society, even though she comes from a Muslim background. She's a progressive, even though she has a kind of reactionary background. So, and, and she's ultimately a kind of skeptic who ends up finding strength in her doubts. And so in many ways, I thought she would be an interesting, as I said, generic character to explore, to explore this conception of dignity that I introduced in my other book, but that I haven't, I didn't do enough work to, to develop in, in free. And so to talk about how dignity in the end lies in kind of choosing one's commitments freely, even when circumstances end up thwarting that dignity and undermining that uh, moral agency. And, and so, and to show how, you know, despite the tragedies that's of life and despite the ambiguities in separating fact from fiction and interpretation from, from truth, in a way, uh, her life and this whole episode around how you tell the story of this life 
would be an interesting way to talk about questions of, um, of what dignity is and how it has been politically appropriated and where this kind of philosophical meaning of dignity lies. So that's it. Thank you.